Hey, friends and clever listeners, it's Amy. We're working our way towards our 200th episode. And in honor of that milestone, we're queuing up a few extra memorable episodes from the archives. Please enjoy this encore presentation. Art chose me. I didn't choose them. And that happened to be something that speaks the language of the world. Hi, everyone. I'm Amy Devers, and this is Clever. Today, I'm talking to multi-award winning illustrator and artist Yuko Shimizu. Born in Japan, but now based in New York City, in Yuko's 20-year career of illustrating, she's had work in the New York Times, Time, Newsweek, The New Yorker, Wired, done covers for DC Comic, Penguin, and Scholastic, and advertising for Apple, Sony, Paramount, MTV, Nike, and Target, to name a few. She is a two-time Hugo Award nominee, has won more than 15 medals from the Society of Illustrators, and was recently awarded the Caldecott Honor. All that, and she also teaches at the School of Visual Arts. But here's a twist. Illustration is her second career. After graduating from college in Japan, Yuko spent 11 years in corporate PR before making the bold choice to reinvent her career at the age of 34, when she moved to New York to get her master's in illustration at SBA. It's a great story. Here's Yuko. My name is Yuko Shimizu. I am an illustrator. I'm originally from Tokyo, Japan, but I'm based in New York City. I think art is a calling. I love drawing and painting ever since I was a child. I'm the happiest when I'm creating artwork and I'm I feel I am very fortunate to be able to do this for a living. Well, we're all fortunate that you get to do this for a living. Thank so you. <laughs> <laughs> I always like to go way back to the beginning. So you were born in Tokyo. Will you tell me all about your childhood, your family, and the your youthful fascinations? I think I come from a pretty typical middle, upper middle class Japanese family. You know, father worked in corporate environment and my mom stayed home and raised me and my older sister, which is like very typical. I started drawing ever since I can remember, but then actually I don't remember the first time I drew. (laughs) <laughs> my mother later told me one day when I was like two, I drew a really wobbly circle and line on the edge of newspaper with crayon and said, Mom, I drew a balloon. And then I kind of never stopped since. I did stop when I grew older, but like as a child, I always drew. I was never athletic. So uh, often after lunch, all the kids go outside and like play dodgeball. And I was so not good at sports and dodgeball hurts. So like, why oh, are other dodgeball kids? Dodgeball is cruel. <laughs> dodgeball is cruel, but like, I don't know how it is now. But when I was a kid, that was like what kids in elementary school love to play. And there are always like maybe five kids out of class of 30 or 40 who rather stay inside after lunch and draw or read. You know, I was one of those kids. That's how things started. (laughs) So just out of curiosity, did your mother or father have any artistic hobbies or inclinations? Did your older sister draw as much as you do? Or were you kind of an outlier in your family? I think it's very common for Japanese people to draw. And even if it's not like really their biggest hobby, I don't know. Like, you know, I grew up surrounded by the first big boom of anime and manga. And so, you know, in Japan, like now it's popular everywhere. But like back in the 60s and 70s, when I was growing up, that was like, you know, the first boom. A lot of kids drew mimicking comics and you know, like not necessarily my parents were into art, but my mother made 
all her clothing and all mine and my sister's growing up. And, you know, I sometimes ask my father to, you know, draw me a samurai and he was able to do it. I don't know how good he was, but I think <laughs> it's like pretty common for Japanese people to draw, like especially like art classes were mandatory up to like high school, which is like very different from how it is in the U.S. So maybe it's like part of the things people did. But it's not that I had any artist in my family. You did say that it's different from the U.S. and you would have some personal experience with that because during adolescence, you and your family moved to Westchester County, New York for four years. <laughs> Oh so my God, you researched that. <laughs> <laughs> you can't hide from me, Yuko. You can't hide. But I am curious about what what the, what that was like for you culturally, emotionally, socially, developmentally. I mean, that's a big culture shock. That's also just a big transition at a sensitive time of life. How did that go for you? So it was a huge culture shock. I was eleven, turning twelve when I moved. And in Japan, I don't know about now because I haven't lived there in like more than 20 years. But back then, at least, English education started in middle school. That's seventh grade. And I moved to New York sixth grade. The day before I started elementary school sixth grade there, my mother sat with me and told me, you have to memorize all the alphabets tonight. Which I don't think I can do, you know, like you you show me like Arabic or like, you know, Hangul or something. Yeah. Like, yeah, you learn it overnight. And, you know, like kids' brains are pretty flexible. So I was able to learn all the alphabet overnight. And she told me like, hi, I'm Yuko. Nice to meet you. And <laughs> where is the where is the toilet? I think those two things, like, you know, you have to memorize these two things. And I was sent to school if you could easily imagine the first year or year and a half was like nightmare. You know, I have to learn the language and I also have to do schoolwork and I don't even know what the homework is because I don't understand what the teachers were saying. Right. So, you know, like I don't think that was the hardest thing I ever experienced in my life, but you know, like what's hard and what's not hard is based on where you are at. And at age 11, 12, and, you know, like my life in school was pretty comfortable. You know, I was pretty popular because I can draw in Japanese elementary school. Suddenly, you know, like I'm in a foreign land. I don't have any friends. I don't know what the hell is going on in school. And then have to adjust to it. So, yeah, year and a half, like, I feel like if I was able to get through that, I can get through anything. And I know, like, I'm saying this knowing there are people who have a lot harder experiences. But not to compare anything, in my life at age 11, that was definitely the hardest thing you know, like, what's funny is, like, I was one of the tallest in school before I left in 11, right? I was, like, 5'2", and, you know, at that age, like, especially boys are still short, so I was one of the tallest, and I was growing, and I moved to U.S., and I completely stopped growing, and then I also am the shortest in my family, which is really weird because I'm shorter than my mother. I read or like heard on the, you know, like new segment or something. Like if a child experienced like a very traumatic situations, they can stop growing. And I, I totally believe that. Yeah. I think the stress of the situation impacted your growth. I mean, like, you know, not that I went through civil war or anything, but like in my mind, it was like the most traumatic thing. So, yeah, I kind of stopped growing and, you know, it took me two, three years to get really comfortable in school. But I always felt like I'm Japanese and I'm very different. And then I spent four years and my family went back to Japan and I came back to Japan like, holy crap. 
people consider me as American, which I am not. So ever since then, and I mean peace with this. Like ever since then, like I went back to Japan when I was like 15, 16. So till now, 40 years later, I still feel like I'm neither Japanese or an American. It was a struggle for me, especially trying to fit myself back in as a dress scent in Japan and like kind of sticking out in a society who d o n t like people sticking out. After I came back and kind of like as an adult, I, I'm like, okay, like I don't need to be an American. I don't need to be a Japanese. I'm kind of half and half, which I'm okay with that. I can understand though how in those formative years, sticking out in the US as being, you know, so Japanese, did you use drawing as a way to communicate? Drawing can sometimes be that thing that transcends the language barrier. Initially, when my English wasn't great, what I excelled in, and especially that I was, I already said I'm the, I wasn't aesthetic, right? So, what I excelled was like, it's kind of stereotype, but math and art. And I'm not good at math, and I never was. But math, like numbers are universal, right? So, if I can listen to, you know, like, Like, understand enough what the teachers were teaching and what we're supposed to learn. It was the easiest thing because I don't have to memorize new terms. So, I don't have to express myself in the language I don't understand. So, I think the teachers thought I was, a, you know, one of those Asian math genius. <laughs> <laughs> But I'm talking about elementary school and like early middle school. So, I excelled that and I also drew more because drawing d o n t need languages. I still feel I'm super lucky to be working in the field of art because it doesn't have borders. Pictures speak the language of anyone, you know, like it's a universal language. Most of my clients are in the US. I sometimes work with Japanese clients, but not much. This weekend, I'm working with a French publisher, but because I don't have to write or read, you know, I just have to you know, communicate with my client, which can be done in English, and then create the artwork French people do understand. But of course, they do because it's just pictures. If someone's in writing or novelists, people outside of their language cannot read it or understand it unless the translation comes out. But visual art, you know, like illustrations, artwork, paintings, these are the universal language. And I feel very, very fortunate that I happen to, it's not my choice, right? It's kind of art chose me. I didn't choose them. And that happened to be something that speaks the language of the world. Back in Japan, after a four year formative stint in the United States, and you're feeling sort of neither Japanese nor neither American, but also sticking, having stuck out in the US and sticking out now in Japan, that's a lot of exposure for a young person. <laughs> yes. Were you feeling compelled to hide or were you kind of embracing the being different? What, what was back in Japan like? And then how did you kind of chart your course toward user, university? I'm sure things are changing, but at the same time, you know, Japan is an island nation. You know, the border means there are seas in between, and the mentality is very different from. Where US, it's、uh, the melting pot, or like, you know, Europe or Latin America or anywhere else, that there are borders. So it's very homogeneous. It's becoming more international every time I go back to Japan, but then there is a feeling, you know, Japan is Japan and it's a separate entity. And sticking out there is really hard. Whenever I mention this, you know, people say something like, you know, oh, but what about this person? Or what about this artist? Or what about that artist? Or what about that film director? And yes, but there are exceptions to anything. You know, if 
someone says, what about, you know, Takashi Murakami, the world famous fine artist? And like, yes, it was probably extremely difficult early on for him to be him and then in Japan. And then he stuck with it and from the start and not many people can pull that off, especially as a woman. You know, it's not an easy place to Japan is not an easy place to live as a woman, and unfortunately still is. So I ended up trying to hide, especially in the beginning, in high school, like college. uh, High school, I went to this weirdo high school where uh, students either are not Japanese or Japanese people who grew up abroad for whatever reasons and came back and They don't have any traditional schools to fit into. It was very comfortable. I'm still close friends with many of my classmates. And whenever I go back to Japan, I hang out with them, have dinners and, you know, coffees and things. But my college was especially, like, very Japanese. Especially that, like, you know, like, Having lived abroad, being able to speak a language outside of Japanese, the country being the female, still like 20, 30, 40 years behind how women are perceived in the U.S., it does not make my life easier when people knew my background. So I try my best to hide it. It's not that easy because I might say something different, Oh, you know, back then, it's like, you know, like 80s. If there was like a big hit show on TV, every high school kids or, you know, college kids watched that. And if you didn't, you're either like really weird (laughs) or like you're hiding something. So it's funny to think about it. Now it's things are so diverse, like even TV shows. You know, like, it's a squid game is, like, popular, but, like, it's okay if you didn't watch it. But, like, back in the day, TV was just, uh, you know, like, five or six channels on the TV set. And without the internet, you couldn't watch Japanese programming in the U.S. or vice versa. Right. exactly. Yeah. So, like, I knew about this, like, super popular TV drama uh, about high school, and everyone watched it, and during college... All like after, like people talk about, oh, yeah, that show, I never ever watched it, and that gave away. And I couldn't win because it's either a weird or never watched a famous TV show, or you lived abroad. That's interesting. Back before the internet, there would be all of these cultural touch points that if you weren't local to that proximity at the time that they were happening, then you missed out on them. And then that becomes like a big missing piece of your quilt that everyone at some point can see. I can see that that would be difficult to hide because everybody has these references that you don't have. So that's interesting that that would show up as something that felt like an like exposing you as being, I guess, more international than you wanted to feel in that moment because it wasn't comfortable to stick out. Yeah, exactly. So you studied at Waseda University with a major in faculty of commerce and graduated as a valedictorian, which is very a high honor applying yourself. But I don't know what faculty of commerce means. And I I don't know how you got there or why you made that choice. Can you explain that? Looking back, it's really weird, right? Like I didn't pursue art because I didn't want to go to art school. But I wasn't sure I wanted to go to art school in Japan. First of all, art school, because, you know, what do regular parents who don't have any artists in the family know about the life of the artists? It's it's like a joke that, like, you know, they think of, like, Van Gogh, right? Like, you're poor, your brother have to send you the paint, and then, you know, you go crazy and kill yourself <laughs> because you're poor. So they're like, don't ever pursue art. I was just an 18, 17, 18-year-old with a hobby of drawing, and I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. A lot of kids in Japan draw I draw quite well, so I'm like, you know, I'm not that special. And then, like, I've been told that. And also, 
I felt like maybe it's a phase. You know, like I wasn't sure. Like all these mixed feelings, and I, oh, I was also not confident enough to say this is what I'm going to pursue. My school, my high school, for weirdos, because you know, <laughs> like we all experience some kind of trauma, the having you know dropped off in a foreign land. I lived in New York, you know, that's kind of like a, had it pretty good. But that's when you know Cold War was still going on, and I had two classmates who came back from Soviet Union, <gasps> and oh another one, and they were, they had the same name. Funny, like two boys. One came back from Soviet Union, and one came back from Afghanistan because the Soviet Union invaded. On top of having have to live abroad for whatever parents' reasons. I don't know what the, what sent their families to Afghanistan and Soviet Union. So, like, on top of like living in a foreign land, having have to learn languages, and they have to experience like war and you know like the height of communism, right? I think what we all had was because of the circumstances we were dropped off in, we learned to kind of work hard. Because like you have to learn the language to survive, and you know you have to do that to be accepted to the local schools we were in. I don't know if it's a Japanese mentality or like it's universal, but like we're constantly told by parents, you know, especially as minorities, that maybe your classmates have never met Japanese people before, and how you behave, how you. Do well or not well academically, your classmates will judge the whole Japanese population, like、oh. according to how you. It's such Asian parents thing. So like we're like <laughs> But that's a lot of pressure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But like I think because of the our school, although there are a lot of weirdos and they're cool and fun, but they excelled academically because of. I think our previous experiences needing to rep all of Japan in foreign countries yeah. by excelling. Yeah, yeah, that's a lot of pressure. Now looking back, but that was a norm. So, like you know, that school did quite well. So a lot of the good schools had slots for our graduating class. Like you know, one person can come to. Our schools, whatever department, whatever department. So there was an open up for Waseda University's、uh, School of Commerce, which is basically like a business major, but like more of、um, not the practical business, but theory. So there are economic classes, you know, the economy classes, and there are. Accounting classes we have to take, you know, like constitution and law classes, like to kind of like you know, like the the build the knowledge to be a businessman. But at the same time, the school was pretty well known for their advertising majors. Ah, okay. Yeah, like they didn't call it majors, but like concentration in advertising. I thought, okay, I'm not sure what I wanted to do, but I want to do something creative, and then I wanted to make my parents happy, and I felt like advertising, you know, going to school of commerce in a good, really good university in Japan, and like you know, make them happy, and also I can do something sort of creative in the most, you know, the most creative in the the most practical world. That was kind of the reason why I went there. Also, the funny thing was back then, the manga club. It's like a you know like the outside school activities, but it's part of school, and it was really really huge in that university. And a lot of the famous comic artists came out of it. Oh, yeah. There was a literature major and. People tend like tend to be a majority of、um, the the circle of the the comic creators. That was one of the reasons I went.、Uh, it didn't work out for me. I always wanted to be a comic artist growing up, but I think I only felt so because 
we grow up reading and mimicking manga. It took me a while to realize I'm not interested in telling stories with panels and pages and coming up with stories, you know, that is like long enough to fill, you know, pages and pages. I was only interested in creating single images. So that led me to illustration ultimately. But back then I was very much interested in comics and those like funny reasonings brought me to the university that I ended up studying. Okay, so you got a, a, a degree in, in basically the theory of business. Part of your appeal for that university was the celebrated manga and comic book artists that yeah. were known for, <laughs> for that school. <laughs> okay, this is all starting to add up. <laughs> and I know that uh, eventually you went back to school to study illustration, but before that... You had a professional first life in advertising and PR. Talk to me about this major chapter of your life and how it influenced you and your eventual decision to go back to school to study illustration. So, yes, after I graduated, I got a job in corporate PR department in a big corporation in Japan but like you would never know the name you know like recognize the name of the company unless you're Japanese but they do like kind of big general tradings all over the world it's a pretty big company in Japan and I got accepted into the PR department by luck it was a good choice considering my background in advertising and marketing but in Japan, it's mostly you get a job in a company and not by job descriptions. They really have this tradition of having employees loyal to the company and people tend to move around and understand and become generalist of the company. That's like a whole tradition of Japanese corporate culture. I'm don't know why I never moved into different departments. So it's not that common for someone to stay in the exact same department for more than 10 years. I was there for 11 years and a bit. Uh, but like it was very lucky because it worked out with my background and interest. And like I said, I wanted to do something creative, at least creative, in the practical field and that kind of fulfilled um, my desire to do so. I thought I will last from the day one because I quickly realized I'm so individualistic. I think I learned this in the US or maybe I always had it. I don't know. I have my opinions and that doesn't work well, especially in a corporate culture in Japan. My job was actually very interesting. You know, like I was able to assign advertising and sometimes work with illustrators, which always I envied and wanted to be on the other side. Oh, yeah. Or like, you know, corporate editing, corporate brochures, because the company is so big and spread around the world and they had like an in-house company magazines to you know talk about what's happening in a company and like who are the people who are working so it's a highly distributed magazine and like I was editing that at some point so it was interesting enough work-wise but the corporate culture wasn't for me but then I still didn't know what I really wanted to do with my life and it took me a while, maybe around age 30. It's hard to quit a job where it's stable and you will get the paycheck every month. So I stuck around a bit and around age 30 and then, oh my God, I'm not a kid anymore. And do I want to just stay here and get old and retire and live off of the retirement. I felt that was not what I wanted to do. So I kind of started really thinking of what I should be doing for myself. 
to make myself happy and have a fulfilled life because as cheesy as it is, we only live once. Yeah, it's a cliche. I get it, but it's true. It is so <laughs> true if you think about it. That's when I started thinking about, you know, like crossing out the options. Initially, I thought, like, oh, I want to go back to US. You know, I want to go back to the East Coast. And so I don't feel like this like weirdo who is not Japanese and always felt like an outsider. And so initially, I thought, like, maybe I should go to like a. In, Get MBA because that made more sense. I was in corporate. I I majored in advertising and marketing. Maybe I can do advertising MBA. I seriously thought about it, and then I talked to my like really good friend who immigrated to US. Mm-hmm. And she became an engineer. Like I met her when I was living in New York. And she's Japanese. And she's like, you know, like she, she gave me the best advice. And like, you know, like in the United States, going back to graduate school means you get out of college, you do whatever you need to do, and you realize what you really want to do for the rest of your life. And when you're committed, that's when you go to graduate school. And so, if you want to do advertising for the rest of your life, you know, it's fine, but like, think it over. You know, what do you really want to do? And I think that was the best advice. The process itself of coming up with going to art school was long, but long story short, I really went soul searching and like, what is one thing I really wanted to do and never do? It's to pursue art. And I also never really wanted to do Jap- go to Japanese art school to begin with. If I go to U.S. for school, even as a non-U.S. citizen, you can get one year of work permit. And then that's your chance to get a work visa and stay here. It's not really as easy to move to U.S. and just start restart your life. And going back to school made the most sense. So that's how I ended up coming back to New York. So you did mention you had to do some soul searching and you have your opinions, and those opinions maybe didn't sit so well in corporate culture in Japan.、Um, was pursuing art also, did that also feel like an avenue where your opinions would be valued instead of、uh, treated as a threat? Yeah, I guess, but then I also didn't want to be an artist in Japan. At that point, I wanted to pursue illustration. I knew comic wasn't the thing for me. And, but there is a very particular way the illustrators create things. You know, they like cute and pretty, and I was never into either of those. <laughs> yes, yeah. I'm getting it now. Okay. <laughs> and also, when I went back to art school, I was 34 already. So, if I'm trying out the second life, first of all, like Japan did not back then appreciate the second life. You know, you get a job right after college and you pursue it for the rest of your life. That was kind of the life path. So, Me doing your life over wasn't easy. Nobody goes back to school, art,、uh, art school at age 34, at least back then. So there were so many reasons Japan wasn't working out for me. And I also wanted to move back to New York where difference is appreciated. Was it re traumatizing to move back to New York at 34? Or did it feel empowering? Because at this point, you are. You know, consciously choosing this? It was both. So, like, unlike some other classmates I had, and some of them came from Japan and they're much younger, and, you know, that's cool, but they struggle with language, right? Like, my English wasn't great. I was only here for four years, but, like, I was okay. I understand everything everyone says, you know, how I. Express myself wasn't perfect, but I can say whatever that was on my mind. You know, that was the English level I had. I realized moving here as an adult 
all by myself and do like take care of everything on my own was much harder than I thought. I thought it would be easier because I lived here as a kid, but the kids' experience and adult experience is completely different. Yeah. So there are a lot of obstacles. That I faced. So, like, first maybe year or two was hard. But then, luckily, I came back as a student. So, you're surrounded by friends. You have a community. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You had a community. So, that was easier because often, if you move as an adult, the hardest thing is to make a community of friends. And you know, to get to know new friends as an adult in a new environment can be difficult, but school made it so much easier for me. So it was, yeah, definitely both traumatizing and like extremely freeing. I'm feeling it. It's like such a scary and exciting chapter of your life. But it also must have really reinforced your own resilience after getting through that. You make the conscious choice. You get here, it's harder than you thought it would be and triggering in in many ways. And yet it's something that you want. So you work your way through it. And as you sort of establish a degree of comfort, what comes with that is also a degree of agency and an ability to move through the world in a way with a kind of trust and confidence that you know how to do it. And that's pretty cool. Yeah, it's, it's, I'm glad, you know, like one thing I'm really happy I did is I moved here and you know like don't get me wrong it wasn't like all smooth and you know especially during school right after I graduated and I started working like I sometimes did wake up in the middle of the night and like you know holy crap what am I doing you know (laughs) like it's I still do that (laughs) yeah like I still do that too but like you know like my friends are all settling down into their adult life right like you know maybe they have family raising kids buying homes you know like they're doing adult things while I'm living with roommates and having (laughs) these roommates problems and I was living (laughs) off of my savings so I have no money you know my dream was to go into Starbucks and buy a coffee without worrying about the four or five dollars I drop. That was my dream. And I remember like I went to some lecture as an undergrad student and like there were some graduate students in the mix of audience and one of them was holding a Starbucks cup. I was like, holy shit, like this person can't afford Starbucks. <laughs> Whenever I woke up in the middle of the night, you know, what I tried to do to calm myself, and I tell this to my students too, because I teach and I have students who are in the similar situation, right? Uh And they worry that, can I stay here? I want to stay here and work, you know, can I make income okay? Like, you know, like all these things. And then I tell myself, at least, at least I'm in New York doing what I really wanted to do. So the rest will figure itself out if I work hard enough. I still feel the same, kind of. I do too. I I think that's really good advice. It's like you're not promising anything and you're not guaranteeing that uncertainty won't be there. But you are saying, consider that you're laying a foundation that is you know, intentionally what you want to do and trust that you'll be able with hard work and some creativity, the rest will not fall into place without effort, but that you will be able to navigate it and make the life that you want. Yeah, I I think so. I mean, you know, what are the other choices, right? And other choice was not coming here and not pursuing art and being in corporate situation where I hate it but like with stable salary and then you know like oh man what would it have been if I had pursued art and then getting older thinking of that like that sounds like 
you know, that sounds really sad. I that's always, torture. Yeah, yeah that's that, torture. That's... But a lot of us do it. And I mean, I did it for a long time, right? Like thinking about what if I pursued art? And there was no answer for that. And there was only questions. I mean, like I could have failed. I could not have been able to get a work permit. I would not have been able to get any freelance association work. And... Had to do something else, you know, God knows what. But at least I tried and then I can move on, right? There's no more asking myself what if I did it. So I think it's really important if we wonder strongly enough about the things we haven't done, we should do it. And if we do it and things don't work out, at least you did it. Yes. And I think there are a lot of things we've done, things didn't work out for whatever reasons. And we kind of move on and not think about it much because we've done it and cross it out. But things we regret are the things that we didn't do after I did this. And, you know, like some people might say, well, but like, you're lucky you did it and it worked out. But then also what people can't forget is I can fail tomorrow. You know, like nobody wants to work with me tomorrow and I can still fail. But at least I've done it. And I think doing it, something that we feel strongly about is very, very important. I agree with you. And even though you could fail tomorrow, um, I don't think you will because there is such a powerful drive underneath what you're doing. And because you've also now built up a pretty solid professional track record since 2003, you've been illustrating professionally and making quite a profound body of work about some tough subjects and, you know, racking up awards and accolades, including um, a Caldecott honor recently for the Catman of Aleppo. Congratulations. Thank you so much. I'm wondering, now that you've sort of built this life for yourself and you've worked really hard to build it and you've put yourself in really uncomfortable situations to get here, do you value it to the degree you thought you would? And do you feel any sense of like peace in the work that you're doing? I had a friend stay with me two weekends ago. Mm-hmm. And we're really good friends. Uh, she is in like super high end uh, web design world, and she's a designer, um, and much younger, but like extremely established. And then like on the weekend, Saturday, we went out, and I was like, "Oh, I'm thinking about the deadlines." And then she's like, "You're so established. Like, why do you work hard? Like, you know, like I work hard, but like I'm over like working." all the time and I want weekends off I want night off and like you should do that and I get it and then like yeah like I get it maybe I still work too much but then I kept thinking about what she said and what I realized is if nobody's paying me money to do projects I still do the same thing you know what I mean (laughs) and Mm -hmm. I don't think, not to, you know, degrade her work, you know, she does amazing work, but I don't think if she's left alone, web designing is what she would do on the weekend when she has free time. So being a visual artist, It's like, yeah, it's my job, but it's not just my job and it's my passion and you know, like I can slack off, but like I care about what I do and what I create. Like I'm just really fortunate. I found my calling and I'm being able to sustain my life with my calling. I want every day to be different uh, in terms of art, right? Like, you know, I want every day to be different. Of course, I want breaks. You know, I was just being Portugal for a conference but like you know I only had like two hours that I have to commit to you know like do lectures and workshops and things and the rest of the time it's like a break so like I appreciate breaks I appreciate travels but 
if I'm left alone, alone, like I will create. And the one of the reasons why I needed to quit my job was every day start to feel the same. And being an artist, every project is different. And that keeps me going. So speaking of every project being different and it keeping you going, I'm super curious about your creative process. Um, I am not an illustrator, obviously, but I'm also like have never thought in 2D or in drawing. Sketching has never even been my strong suit. Can you give me an overview of your creative process and maybe how ideas start to shape in your brain and then you get them out? Yeah, so often people who create world from nothing right that's what we do and from the outside it's like a magic you know like we might have this like light bulb in our head and that's light up and we get inspired and create cool things but Mm -hmm. it doesn't really work that way um (laughs) it's a lot more struggle than that (laughs) a lot more struggle than that and uh, also a lot more structured and logical than what People might think, of course, everyone works differently, right? But so I can only speak for myself, but I do not have light bulbs. Sometimes I do in a very, very lucky situation, but most of the times I don't. Uh, So if it's a work project, you know, like, so I'm working for French magazine right now. It's a cover and then, like, you know, they approach me and, like, do you want to do this? You know, this is the overall view of this idea. And, like, oh, that sounds interesting. So, like, first of all, does the project feel like something that is suitable for me? When it's not, I will tell them, you know, there are people who are more suitable for this than me. So, first, I have to get excited or oh, excited enough. And then I got excited. And, okay, give me materials. Well, it's a French magazine, so I didn't read article because I don't read articles, but I asked questions about what it is, and he explained to me what the article was about and sent me some photos that accompany the article. So usually I read articles. And from there, okay, I need to learn a little bit about a subject. In this case, it's a person or the group of people. So I Google search about them, and look at more photos and maybe read about them to understand. The more information I accumulate, it is better for me to come up with ideas. So ideas don't come from thin air. Ideas come from research. The more I know, the more ideas I might be able to give. So I start thinking about what's visual, you know, what do I need to say in terms of this specific article? And then then I draw like really quick sketches onto the paper that I I might be the only person who understands it, but it's okay. It's like, I call it brain puke. It's like... <laughs> thinking on the paper and a lot of things come out not right but in order to get to the right days everything needs to come out and then after a while of doing that maybe I have like two or three ideas that may work and then I refine compositions for those ideas and then made it into a like sketches that the client sees and understand what is in the picture. And then I send that out and explain, you know, why I did this and what it means and how that relate to the article they sent me. And then they say, you know, sketch one or sketch two, whatever. And like, oh, I like this one. And I put in the layout. So, and, you know, that's approved. And once it's approved, I draw with ink and brush on watercolor paper and then scan that in and color it on Photoshop and the final file only exists as the digital file but I do this funny process nowadays all my students are starting everything digitally like especially on iPad because of I think the pandemic accelerated the use of um, iPad 
because you know they can work anywhere in small space and you know it's less stressful like you don't need scanners and like multiple different things you don't need a lot of space you have everything on one iPad so like that's how it is now but in my case I still draw because drawing is my passion and coloring is my work and but the piece won't get finished unless it's colored that part is done on a computer but the fun part needs to be done by the most fun process for me it is drawing that's your first language yeah it is i love that you explained that for me i was there with you through every step and i feel like i really want to see some brain puke um if you <laughs> would share one of your brain puke pages, I I think I would be so fascinated in that. Sure. So in terms of your professional development, do you have kind of criteria for, you mentioned before undertaking a project, you need to feel that it's right for you and you need to be excited about it. Is some of that informed by the relationships, by the people? Is there some way that you choose to work with certain people or or companies or is it mostly project-based? Both. And in terms of people, like, I didn't become where I am by myself. People supported me, especially in the beginning. People took chances on me and people are nice to me. I was starting out. I had no money and they gave me jobs. So whenever some of my early clients come to me and you know, want to work with me and the budget is small or whatever, if it fits in the schedule, I do it. Because the relationship is very important. And the, the fact that they helped me start my career is very, very important for me to, you know, like sort of pay back to. Yeah, no, that's nice. That's honoring a long-term relationship, even though you can afford Starbucks now. Yes. <laughs> you, you still haven't forgotten where you came from. And I know. <laughs> those relationships, I think, you know, the, the older I get, the more I value the relationships that have this length to them. Maybe they've not been that close, but they've existed through different chapters and they sort of have a, a stability to your interaction with them that's kind of comforting to know that there are there are posts in the world that you can always stop at and enjoy a familiarity with with people and it's it's really important to to nurture those in your life otherwise you'll always feel unmoored probably early on i didn't quite understand it enough and so i stress this to my students often that at the end of the day illustration business is people business you know you're dealing with people and so you know if you do incredibly amazing work but you're extremely difficult self-centered person then the clients never want to work with you like they want your art but they rather not go through what they have gone through I always tell them, like, work hard, be nice, (laughs) which is very important. Like, we forget, and in art school, generally, they're really good at teaching art, you know, how to make art, but making art, you know, like, if you just want to make art for yourself and you don't have to worry about making a living, you know, do whatever you need and you don't have to be nice, whatever, right? But, like, if you want to be working in the field at the end of the day you have to collaborate with people and they rather work with someone who's really nice to work with and the work is good but not like incredible if getting an incredible work meaning they have to put up with so much You know, like in the beginning, we kind of focus too much on artwork and like we don't understand, but like we start understanding. So like I I try to tell, repeat to my students, that's 
how it is. And I think, you know, just to recap your your earlier mention of you only live once, I think, you know, after you've been working professionally for a while, there becomes this real imperative to work with people that you want to work with who make the process enjoyable, who you want to support because they appreciate it and they want to support you in return. Like that reciprocal relationship is so important because it's what adds joy to the process and the process is what you fill your days with and still some projects come easy and some projects are really really difficult for whatever reason we can't avoid it but like at least we can try to be nice right (laughs) (laughs) so important and everybody needs that reminder now there's a lot of like weird acting out that's happening in the wake of the pandemic because people have been cooped up and you know suffering through extreme anxiety and you know if we just are all extra nice to each other I think we can mitigate some of that totally agree totally how would you like your life and by that I mean all aspects your your personal life your professional life how would you like it to evolve over the long term that's an interesting big question as I said my life as a visual artist is not, I mean, like, you know, of course I do work and then like I do need certain separation from work and life, but it's intertwined a lot more so than, you know, maybe other occupations. So, you know, I will still, I might make different things, but I will still make art even when nobody's assigning me work. So that's part of my work, but it's part of my passion and private life. So it is hard for me to divide. You know, I would love to make, create, generate more of my own projects. And I've been saying this for some time, but I really want to illustrate Aesop's Fables as a book. And I already have been talking to a small publisher who fund uh, everything through Kickstarter and make like beautiful books. And so they're like, you know, like uh, we're on board. You just have to do it. Like it's really hard, especially like through the pandemic, I'm working from home and everything gets blurred, right? Like I feel like I'm working all the time when I'm not sleeping, but You know, like right now, because everything's so uncertain, I might be taking on more work than usual because, you know, like prepare for like whatever might come out, you know, if bad things don't come, at least I have something that I feel comfortable about. But um, eventually I would love to go back to the studio. Now I'm working from home and, you know, tackle on the project like I'm an illustrator and then people tend to think illustrators when we do our own things we make fine art some people are like that and maybe I'll be like that in the future like God knows you know like I'm an artist and I would love to evolve as an artist but I also love the idea of being an illustrator so make my own project like Aesop's Fables and you know, in the perfect world, it's probably not that easy. But like, if I get to illustrate, you know, all the stories in like with one picture each, that will be like years of work. But like that might be, you know, like things like that might be fun thing to do. Regardless of I'll be working or not working, I'll be creating. And I would like to create more of my own initiated projects and I love to travel and I love to travel and see the world and I will also love to you know like use my artwork to do more good whatever that means in a broad sense you know not just like charity work or like you know sell drawings to raise money for non-profit or my choice like yeah those things I do but you know like help next generation of artists in whatever way I can. One is teaching, you know, like all these things. And as you know, the social media sphere has gotten very toxic, especially over the pandemic, I guess because we're like 
glued onto the phone because at some point we couldn't even go outside, right? And the frustration and anxiety comes out as attacking other people. But like you said, like if we try to spread the positive, like think like it will be so much better world. And also there is like, you know, it's true that people who have bigger social media uh, presence tend to get attacked more. I don't have like gigantic following, but I have big enough following. I sometimes do get social media attacks. You know, like I would like to use my platform to like spread positive more than negative. So like on Instagram, what I like to do when I have a lot of mental space is to give advice to people who want to be an artist or like who are starting out because like I can teach my students but they're only maybe 30 in total each year but in social media I get to you know talk to like you know 100,000 people if they want to you know hear what might help them and also what I want young artists, struggling artists to know the field of illustration of visual art is not a zero-sum game. And looking at, like, you know, artists attacking artists, I feel like a lot of people think if I don't get that job, you know, they will get it. Like, you know, like there is a pie and limited amount and some people took the big chunk and there is nothing left for them. But mm-hmm. it doesn't work that way if the people who are already working in the field do great job. And then a lot more people, like random audience, I'm not talking about artists, think, oh, it's cool to work with illustrators because our brand or, you know, whatever looks cooler. And then they want to work more with artists. And it's not a pie it's something like universe it spreads but in order to spread someone like me who's considered established in the field and others who are doing well we have we have obligation to do better and by us doing better it helps the newcomers and for the newcomers who are freaking out about pandemic or like trying to get their foot in the door. We, not just me, but we want them to know that we're working so there are more projects for them. Right. It is not a finite pool from which all artists are drinking from. And in fact, the more that art is valued and recognized as also commercially viable, the bigger the pool becomes and the more room there is for everyone to get in and splash around and do their thing. And then the world itself becomes more vibrant and lively and more beautiful and full of texture and color and illustrations and niceness. <laughs> I, I I truly believe so. And it's not my, you know, like fantasy. It is really, really true. I am with you 100%, and I am grateful for you at, out there at the edge of illustration, making the, the pie and the pool and the universe just bigger and better for everyone. <laughs> Thank you so much for, for sharing your story, Yuko. This has been so wonderful spending this time with you. Well, thank you, Amy, and thank you, people who are listening. I had a great time having conversation with you. Hey, thanks so much for listening. For a transcript of this episode and more about Yuko, including images of her work and a bonus Q&A, head to cleverpodcast.com. If you like Clever, there are a number of ways you can support us. Share Clever with your friends. Leave us a five-star rating or a kind review. Support our sponsors and hit the follow or subscribe button in your podcast app so that our new episodes will turn up in your feed. We love to hear from you on LinkedIn, Instagram, and Twitter. I mean, X. You can find us at Clever Podcast, and you can find me at Amy Devers. Please stay tuned for upcoming announcements and bonus content. You can subscribe to our newsletter at cleverpodcast.com. 
Clever is hosted and produced by me, Amy Devers, with editing by Rich Strafolino and Mark Zerowinski, production assistance from Alana Nevins and Anushka Stefan, and music by L1011. Clever is a proud member of the Surround Podcast Network. Visit surroundpodcasts.com to discover more of the architecture and design industry's premier shows. Music